Welcome back, everybody, to another special edition of the Buzzwords Podcast. Today, we're talking about breathing, aka pulmonology. And I'm joined, as always, with my co host, Bo. How are you doing today, Bo? Hello, everyone. I am doing fantastic. So, we are running Pulm today. We have a little presentation in addition to our podcast. So, if you're listening to this through our podcast and you go, hey, I don't have time to listen to the video as well, or I don't want to, hop onto our website. We'll have the slides there with a lot of high yield information. So, uh, we don't want to leave anyone out. We want everyone to get all the information uh, that's available, and we'll make sure that today, regardless of how you're listening or watching us, uh, you will be able to understand everything we're seeing and get the most out of this next couple minutes. All right, you Bob, know it. What, Let's jump right what in. What are it. you uh, drinking today? I am drinking honey wheat from North High Brewing Company. Very what nice. What are you drinking? I'm drinking the Pineapple Farm Hazy IPA. Nice. It's actually a local from Coronado Brewing Company, so I'm very excited. Cool. Well, shall we crack them? Let's do it. Sorry, we cut something there. Bill really messed up, but it's okay now. So let's keep talking. All right. So, Bobby. Yeah. First patient today comes in. It's a 70 year old guy. He goes, I've just been getting more and more tired. It's harder for me to walk, you know, three or four blocks, and I can't sleep laying down. And you see this chest x ray. Can you describe for the listener what you see in this chest x ray and what you think the diagnosis is for this gentleman? Yeah. So, based off the clinical vignette, it sounds like he might be having some congestive heart failure, and this chest x ray definitely supports that. Um, what I see is a lot of hazy opacities that are not really localized to any specific area, maybe a little bit worse in the bottom. Uh, I would describe this as kind of a fluffy looking chest x-ray. So I would think that he probably is having some pulmonary edema. Yep, definitely. And how would you treat that? I would give him some vitamin L, also known as Lasix. That's very nice. I've never heard it uh, described like that. But yeah, exactly. Heart failure exacerbation for the boards. You got to think about orthopnea. You got to think about dyspnea with the exertion and the management is diuresis, diuresis, diuresis. You want to get that Frank Starling back to an appropriate level. Uh, there might be a trick question in there. If someone's in a heart failure exacerbation, you might think like, oh, like you want to give them the protocols where, uh, you know, you save them, save the heart regarding mortality. And that would be like beta blockers among other things. But remember, in uh, people like this, they actually need that adrenergic drive. So beta blockers would actually be contraindicated until you get uh, the patient more stable. So diuresis, 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 that is the name of the game for this gentleman. Very good. Definitely. Not to be confused with diarrhea. Don't uh, recommend that on rounds as the treatment for Right. CHF. That's never the right answer unless... Maybe. <laughs> Regardless, I'll drink to that. Cool. Okay, let's see. So... A retired shipbuilder who now does construction work, particularly plumbing part-time, comes in complaining of cough, shortness of breath, and he's coughing up some blood. What is his most likely form of lung cancer? His most likely form of lung cancer will be a non-small cell cancer. So shipbuilding makes me think of asbestos. Um, I could also maybe... Think about smoking as well, if I could make a leap there. But uh, I would think probably like squamous would be my guess, or non-small cell if you're trying to be a little bit more general. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. me more. That's exactly right. So um, this chest x-ray that I showed you is actually a little bit of a trick because the most common cause of, or most common type of lung cancer in people who have asbestos exposure, especially if they smoke at the same time, is actually bronchogenic carcinoma, so like you said, squamous or a non-small cell. Um, but something to keep in mind is if somebody has mesothelioma, then the only way that they're really going to get that is from shipbuilding. So it's one of those trick questions that shows up where you'll get asked like what the most common cause of or type of cancer is in these individuals, and it's actually not mesothelioma. It's typically squamous. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they... Uh put in maybe the fact that the person was a pirate or something like that because 
of how hot pirates are nowadays. So I look yeah. for that kind of stuff. Yeah, if they describe, you know, any sea shanties, I think you got your diagnosis right there. So you're yeah, good to go. Liked it. So what is this chest x-ray showing you? This chest x-ray is uh, one of the more complex chest x-rays I've ever seen. I see multiple opacities in both lungs. I see them kind of, I would say more so in the periphery, although there is some opacification, uh, I guess, more proximal as well. So I guess I would say uh, it looks like almost like the pleural lining is a little bit more opacified on the edges, almost like calcification. Yeah, exactly. So these are pleural plaques consistent with asbestos exposure. Your body likes to wall stuff off that it determines is foreign. And often that comes in the form of calcium, which shows up well on a chest x-ray. So these are the pleural plaques. This doesn't necessarily mean that the patient has mesothelioma, but it's definitely a precursor to mesothelioma. So if you see these, that person's probably going to get more of a mesothelioma, mesothelioma workup going forward. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Cool. All right, Bobby. So I have a patient come in. They were on a long car ride, and you have a suspicion for a certain diagnosis. They come in short of breath. And my question for you is, what is the most common uh, abnormal EKG finding that you find in this patient? And then what is the most common x-ray finding? And we'll start from there. So the most common EKG finding associated with the clinical picture that you're giving me, which I think would be consistent with a pulmonary embolism, is actually sinus tachycardia. And the most common x-ray finding is actually nothing. You usually don't see it on x-ray, but you can actually have a I forget, I think it might be called like a Hutchinson's hump, which is like a wedge-shaped infarct on the edge, but that's very rare to actually see in practice. Yep, yep, exactly. So pulmonary embolism, uh, the classic vignette is maybe someone with cancer who's hypercoagulable. You want to think about, you know, the triad. You want to think about stasis. You want to think about hypercoagulability. You want to think about breakdown of the blood um, vasculature. And so in this case, someone with a long car ride, someone with factor V blighton, someone uh, with cancer, you want to think about thrombosis. And in this case, uh, pulmonary embolism, like Bobby said, sinus tach is the most common EKG finding. And in this case, I put an EKG up on uh, the screen here for Bobby to interpret. Bobby, what this isn't sinus tach, but what is the specific EKG finding here? So I think I know what you're getting at. So I'm going to move you over here next to me. And the classic other EKG finding besides sinus tach is signs of, I believe it's caused by right heart strain, which makes sense because, you know, pulmonary embolism is going to increase the resistance of the vasculature in the lungs. But it's actually called S1Q3T3 syndrome or, or sign, I guess, where you have a big S wave in lead one, and then they develop a Q wave in lead three, and then an inversion of the T wave in lead three as well. Yep, exactly. S1Q3, T3, very specific, but you won't always see it. It might be the hint that gets to the right answer on this test, but likely uh, won't see it in practice. But if you do, very specific uh, for pulmonary embolism. Well done. Yeah, and it's probably not going to show up. Sorry, it's probably not going to show up on um, the USMLE too frequently, but it definitely shows up as a PIM question. So. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And so pulmonary embolism can cause issues down the line, of course, and you want to anticoagulate these patients. That's the treatment. And someone can have basically chronic pulmonary hypertension uh, down the line, and, and chronic pulmonary emboli could be one of the etiologies. So there's actually uh, five etiologies of pulmonary hypertension. Could you name maybe two of the five or two of the five etiologies uh, for more chronic pulmonary hypertension? Sure. So the uh, kind of gimme answer is always the classic um, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Then there's pulmonary hypertension as a result of like fibrodysplastic disease. And then another one would be 
if the patient has left heart failure or right heart failure, that'll also cause pulmonary hypertension. Yep, perfect. So five reasons. First reason, primary pulmonary hypertension. The gene that I've actually seen on USMLE exams is BMPR2. That's inheritable gene. Uh, it can cause idiopathic primary pulmonary hypertension. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, left heart disease, which Bobby mentioned. Reason number three, remember lung disease. We have kind of a VQ mismatch. We have um, more pulmonary hypertension because of that. So um, you could think of that as like sleep apnea, COPD, if someone's chronically in a high altitude, things like that. Uh, reason four is kind of what we alluded to here with pulmonary emboli. You have chronic thromboembolic disease. And then reason five is just miscellaneous rare disorders um, kind of all fall in there. So that's kind of just the criteria uh, that you have to think about when someone has pulmonary hypertension. It's probably one. It's, it's definitely one of those five. Cool. The fifth is just a catch them all. Otherwise not specified. <laughs> well, I'll drink to that. Okay, so you have a young woman who's not a smoker and she comes in and gets a chest CT for an unrelated reason and you see this large peripheral nodule. What are you concerned about? Peripheral nodule, woman, non-smoker, makes me think of adenocarcinoma. Yep, exactly. So... This was just kind of one of those questions for, to remind you of, you know, kind of the risk factors for the different types of lung cancer. So squamous cell tends to be more central as opposed to peripheral and tends to be in older male smokers. And adenocarcinoma almost exclusively occurs in young non-smoking women. So if a young woman comes in and she has lung cancer, you should be more concerned about adenocarcinoma versus squamous. And then having it be peripheral like it is on this uh, chest slice will help kind of guide you in that direction even more. Definitely. Very high yield. Nice. I'll drink to that, even though so far I'm uh, two for two. Mm -hmm. It's like you read ahead or something. We won't tell the listener how many times we've tried this episode. It's our first try. So, first try, always. Never any technical issues. That was my brother who recorded the other episode in Minecraft. In, in Minecraft? <laughs> uh, so, I have a 28-year-old gentleman. He comes to the ED. He goes, Dr. Bobby, please help me. I have fever. I have cough. I'm weak. His blood pressure is fine. He's a little tacky. He has multiple needle tracks down his arms, and he's in sinus tack, but it's otherwise normal. His chest x-ray reveals scattered lesions kind of throughout the periphery. And so my question to you, it's kind of a level deeper than what you're likely used to, so don't feel uh, bad if you get this wrong, but mm -hmm. what likely murmur would you hear in this gentleman? So... Based off of the clinical picture that you're giving me and these imaging findings that are kind of concerning for probably septic pulmonary emboli secondary to endocarditis, drug-induced endocarditis typically affects the tricuspid valve. So I would be expecting a tricuspid regurge murmur, most likely. Fantastic. And one level deeper, if the person inspires, would it get louder or would it get quieter it will get louder perfect yep so exactly right if you see on this chest x-ray and for the listener at home uh you have chest x-ray could be non-specific but you do see a little bit of a nodule in the right lung and then on ct you definitely see multiple areas kind of of, of nodular opacities and uh that can kind of point you point you towards septic pulmonary emboli especially in a drug user and remember Typically, endocarditis will be mitral valve and an aortic valve, but in a drug user, you think about tricuspid valve, and in this case, that's very true. You'd get that holosystolic murmur in the tricuspid area that would be worse with inspiration, because remember, when you inspire, 
you take a deep breath and blood comes back from the venous system and therefore you'll have more blood being regurgitated uh, through the tricuspid valve and therefore it would be louder. Very well done, Bobby. I'll drink to that kind of reverse Cheers. drink since you did so well. I have a uh, follow question to you. Do you think that this is this person's first bout of endocarditis? No. Why not? I would say probably based off the imaging, there's areas that are kind of like cavitary lesions or maybe like scar down lesions. Yeah. I was more pointing at um, that valve looks pretty bright. I don't know if it's actual native tissue or it might actually be a uh, replacement. No, Bobby, that is so deep cut. Good. Yeah. Dab on the haters. Yeah, that's a. Uh... You just pulled that out on me, and I'm the one that found this picture, so. <laughs> well, I cannot confirm or deny, but I'm going to uh, just drink. Cheers. Yeah, that's a great point. So, you have a guy come in. He's like a middle-aged gentleman. May or may not have smoked in a previous life. And you get this chest x-ray, and it's ominous because it has a positive arrow sign pointing to what appears to be a pulmonary nodule. What are you going to do? For, what's the first thing that you're going to do for him? You are going to see how that nodule has progressed by looking at prior imaging. Yep, exactly. So solitary pulmonary nodules are easy questions for, it shows up on the internal medicine shelf fairly frequently, and then also will show up on step probably once or twice because there's kind of a complicated diagnostic algorithm that they want you to know that they can kind of try and catch you with if you don't know kind of the ins and outs of it. So exactly. First thing you're going to do, if you see this on a chest x-ray and they have a chest x-ray from three or four years ago and it, it's still there and it's the same size, you're actually done. You don't really have to worry. But if they don't have any previous imaging or it was there on previous imaging, but it was like smaller and it's gotten bigger, then your next step is actually going to be advanced imaging, typically in the form of a CT scan. And then based off of that, there's a few different things that'll kind of further direct your workup and potential intervention. So if it's benign features, which would be things like it being under 0.8 centimeters and somebody who's like under 40 years old and they don't smoke or they quit like 20, 15, 20 years ago, and it kind of looks like this where it's smooth and round it doesn't have like any areas of heterogeneity there's no like obvious excess calcification then you would probably just get regular ct scans to watch it if it's kind of more intermediate or suspicious you would probably do a biopsy or a pet scan so that would be things like if it was greater than 0.8 to like 0.2 centimeters somebody who's like 40 to 60 years old current smoker if it's has a bit more like scalloped or areas of calcification or if it's kind of stellate where it looks like it's kind of branching out then that's when you want to consider doing a biopsy or a PET scan. And then if it's highly suspicious, so anything that's over two centimeters, somebody who's over 60, somebody who has like, you know, a hundred pack year smoking history and it has corona radiata or like a speculated appearance, kind of like a speckled egg or corona radiata, which is basically like a circle around the edge, then you're just going to go straight to surgery and try and get it out because that's very concerning for actual malignancy. Right. Very nice. Very high oh. yield. Yeah, I think especially for the family med boards, you should know kind of like the guidelines as to uh, when to, yeah, you know, reassess, when to even give someone maybe a low dose CD, among other things. Definitely. So for the USPSTF guidelines, which the family med shelf loves to test you on, I believe it's anybody who is over, or specifically it's male smokers who are over 55 and who have, I believe, over a 30 pack year smoking history they will get annual low-dose CT scans to check for development of lung malignancy. Yep. But that hasn't been proven to be effective in any other group because the incidence isn't high enough. Yeah, and there's a, a certain number of years that if you've quit, then you don't need... Um... Yeah, I believe if they've quit within the last 15 years, mm -hmm. then they're okay. The thing is, these guidelines are updated every couple of years, so... 
if you're not watching this right when it came out, I would double check those anyway. They're worth, the USPSDAF guidelines are worth knowing. They show up a lot on the family med shelf and even on step two, so. Yep. I remember my one regret for both the family med shelf and for the step two exam uh, was not reviewing just guidelines in regards to colon cancer, lung cancer, among other things, as thoroughly as I should have because there were so many questions about them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right, well done, Bob. I'll drink to that. Cool. All righty. This uh, brew is the 2014 World Beer Cup. I don't know what that means, but it's awesome. It's finally aged. So, Bobby, I have a patient that presents to the hospital with pyelonephritis, and you're like, pyelonephritis, this is a lecture on the lungs, but stay with me. So, stays, comes to the hospital with pyelonephritis, subsequently breaks out into atrial fibrillation, and started on therapy while in the hospital, and then is discharged with improvement, um, but now he returns two to three months later, um, and it's just more short of breath, is having a hard time breathing, and you get a chest x-ray that looks like this. It's a little broad and a little kind of nonspecific, but what do you think might be going on? So, pyelonephritis, AFib, he gets converted, and then he's having symptoms a couple months later. I would be worried about some potential toxicity from the drugs used to cardiovert and his potential new medication regimen, so I would be worried about pulmonary fibrosis or potentially like a pneumonitis from amiodarone. Exactly. So perfect case scenario where you get amiodarone on board. Amio, as we know, can cause a lot of different side effects. Just review that sketchy sketch where uh, you got the bow tie, you got the thyroid, you got the lungs, you got the liver. There's a whole slew of things that can go wrong. Um, a lot of it is dose dependent. So in this gentleman, they got the pyelonephritis. Uh, that's kind of a red... I guess not a red flag, but a red herring, and um, that's treated adequately, but the amio has started. And because the amio started, and what you can see on this chest x-ray is kind of more peripheral consolidation, which is classic for amio. This would be a classic chest x-ray for amio, and amio can cause a lot of things like pneumonitis and interstitial disease. So uh, in this case, you would want to stop the amio to run and switch them to another regimen. Otherwise, uh, this is no bueno for the long term, but that's exactly right. Definitely. And I think amiodarone is one of those drugs that works really well for its intended purpose, but all of the side effects tend to be like cumulative dose related. So it's one of those drugs that they tend to, they won't start it in a young person. They'll only give it to an old person hoping that, that it won't matter that the drug effects like accumulate by the time that they, you know, pass away. Yeah. So I'll sense. drink to that. It's kind of like giving CTs. Right, exactly. So, somebody comes in. They recently had a bout of pneumonia, but they got antibiotics, they were recovering well, but they're still having some shortness of breath. So you get a chest x-ray just to see what's going on, and you see this chest x-ray. Would you mind kind of describing what you see and maybe what you think is going on here? Sure. For the listener at home, the chest x-ray looks generally okay, other than the left lower lobe, where you cannot see the diaphragm. You can't really see the extent of the heart border as well. So in this case, uh, because you kind of lose that hemidiaphragm, I'd be concerned for a left-sided pleural effusion. Yeah, exactly. And what are kind of the two broad categories of pleural effusion, and how would you yep. differentiate them? Perfect. So you have exudative and uh, transudative. In this case, uh, they had a bout of pneumonia, if I'm not mistaken, so you might be leaning already uh, kind of anchoring on exudative. But uh, exudative and transudative, if you want to think with the lights criteria, uh, you can assess the fluid and you can think, okay, what is the pleural protein to serum protein? Is it greater than 0 0.5? In that case, exudative. Is the pleural LDH greater than serum LDH? I'm sorry, is the pleural LDH over serum LDH greater than 0 0.6? That would be exudative as well. Or is the pleural fluid LDH greater than two thirds the upper limit? of normal serum LDH. In that case, that'd be exudative as well. And then when you kind of jump into those two categories, it gets much easier in regards to diagnosis. If you think of transudative, 
uh, you're thinking more of a CHF, a cirrhosis, or a nephrotic syndrome. And if you're thinking uh, exudative, uh, the things that come to mind, at least for me, are pneumonia, malignancy, maybe pancreatitis, um, PE, collagen vascular disease, kind of uh, things like that, maybe trauma as well. And I know if you see a lot of fat in the pleural effusion, you can even think of um, a kind of a lymphatic issue as well. Anything else I'm missing? No, exactly. You covered it pretty well. So like you said, certain exudative fluids to keep in mind. So if it's bloody, you want to be, you're probably concerned about malignancy or PE, assuming it's not in the setting of trauma, and then it can be trauma. If they have high lymphocytes, it could be TB. And then if they have a low pleural glucose, it can actually be rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune diseases. And then like you said, if it has a really high lipid content, that actually can be due to obstruction of the thoracic duct, which right. is like you said, a lymphatic drainage issue, which can be due to a couple of different things. And then like you said, for transitive, yes, yeah, CHF, nephrotic syndrome, or cirrhosis. So transitative stuff, if you do a tap, it's going to be thin and it's usually due to like a low albumin state. And then exudative, it's like thick and gross. So whatever's in there is going to be kind of nasty. Yep. And so, yeah, a lot of the exudative processes, you might even need to create kind of a, a chronic kind of chest tube um, portal for the drainage to come out until you can kind of figure out what's going on. Like an empyema, for example, you might need to drain that quite thoroughly. Um, and for like CHF, uh, the answer would not be to put a chest tube in, the answer would just be to diuresis. Uh, although the pleural fusions are kind of the last things to go, um, the correct answer would be just to continue diuresis and hopefully they will improve. Yep, definitely. The, the fluid will resorb on its own. You just have to treat whatever the underlying cause is for transudative. And then like you said, for exudative, it kind of depends on the cause of it, but intervention may be needed. So if it's like an infectious cause, like you said, you'll probably have to give them systemic antibiotics. You might even have to like go in and wash out the pleura or even give like fibrinolytics in certain instances, like if it's an empyema. Yep, exactly. We do that all the time on the medical wards, it's push TPA into the pleural fluid and then have them turn on this side, turn on that side, and uh, kind of break up the empyema, the strands. Get those form. juices flowing. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, it's delicious. All right, my last question for you, Bobby, is we've been talking about lung cancer a lot, actually. And so if I gave you a perineoplastic syndrome, could you tell me the lung cancer? So let's start off with SIADH. Okay. So SIADH would make me concerned for small cell. Perfect. And what about hypercalcemia? So hypercalcemia, I believe, is squamous. Perfect. And last one, this is the hardest one, Cushing syndrome. So Cushing syndrome is also small cell. Perfect. Yep, exactly. So I kind of think of a small cell as almost like an endocrine Kind of manifestation and also a neuro manifestation because I know it can cause some antibodies like anti U, Y U uh, antibodies that can cause um, maybe a little bit of like an encephalopathic picture. But so that's how I think about small cell. And then squamous cell, classic, classic, classic is PTH related peptide causing hypercalcemia. So I think those are the, the ones that I at least uh, never forget in regards to perineoplastic syndrome. Definitely. And then I think the one other antibody mediated like neuro endocrine thing to keep in mind with small cell is um lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome which is like oh, the presynaptic right. calcium channel autoantibody thing which is like you should know you should be able to differentiate that from myasthenia gravis Fantastic. as well yep exactly it gets better and better as long as the more you use the muscle right, right. exactly so bobby i have a picture here a couple pictures here uh could you describe for the listener what you're seeing so this looks like a chest X-ray of an adult male. And on the AP view, it looks a little bit more dark in the lung fields than I would expect for a normal individual. And the diaphragm looks to be maybe a little bit flattened. And then on the lateral view, kind of the same thing where the AP front to back diameter is increased, which would make me think kind of like a if you saw this person, you might describe them to have maybe a barrel chest. So I would think potentially like COPD, emphysema type picture. 
Yep. Barrel makes me think of pirates, so I would even say yeah. pirate chess at this point. Uh, for popular culture. But Sea Shanty Sternum. Sea Shanty <laughs> Sternum. Oh, make sure you trademark that because that is going to go quick. So, uh, this Already patient comes to Bobby. Already got the UR. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, fantastic. So, uh, COPD, exactly. You see more of the ribs. You see kind of just a nice big barrel chest. If this patient came to you and said, I've been smoking for 50, 60 years, and you say, hey, you know what? You should not smoke. And they go, is it, is it really, does it really matter if I don't smoke now? I've already been smoking for 50 years. What would your answer be to them? So yeah, it does matter. The damage has been done by his previous, his or her previous smoking history, but cessation of smoking will kind of decrease that trajectory of decline and make it so that it, because naturally as you age, you lose some amount of lung function each year, but it will, him, or her stopping smoking will make it so that their rate of decline more matches the general public of somebody who is a non-smoker. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable how stopping smoking can, can really, really, really make a drastic impact based off a couple studies that have come out. So that's exactly the right answer. Stopping smoking actually has a mortality benefit. So do not forget that that is another one that loves, 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 loves to pop up. Yeah. What would you be worried about if you saw a chest x-ray like this in somebody who was like 20, 25 years old? You would be worried about... Maybe they had some Emphys liver findings too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't tell me. Hey, I knew it before you said that. That's cheating. Now people think I'm gonna need I needed that hit, and I didn't. For the listener at home, I didn't need that hit. I'm trying to stall for you. Come on. Alpha-1 antitrypsin. Very good. Nice. Nice. I was thinking good pastures, and I was like, it's not good pastures. Though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It's a, there's something about, right, central lobular emphysema versus... Yeah, pan lobular. Yeah. So, yeah. Alpha-1 mm -hmm. antitrypsin. Yeah, liver findings. Fantastic. Good pastures, on the other hand, would be more of a type 2 hypersensitivity. It would be kind of... You would probably have a presentation more of hemoptysis... And you'd also have renal findings, not liver findings, but renal findings like a glomerulonephritis due to the direct type 2 hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. That type 4 collagen, baby. Don't forget it. All right, that is... <laughs> that is it for today. That is it for today. Bobby, how was your brew? It was pretty good. I'd give it a 9 out of 10. I actually drank the other five of these. And I was saving this one for this podcast, and I was looking forward to drinking it. So, a nine out of ten. That is probably the highest uh, I think a review you've ever given in a beer. It's up there. It's pretty tasty. That's awesome. Does it actually taste like honey? Yeah. Well, it tastes like. I mean, it's called honey wheat, and it definitely tastes like a sweet kind of wheaty beer. Like, there's definitely hints of honey in it. So, it's pretty good. Fantastic. And yeah, Beer Advocate would agree with you that it is a fantastic beer at 82. So it's wonderful. Nice. My beer is uh, the Pineapple Farm Hazy IPA by Coronado Brewing Company. It is also a beer that uh, I've been having recently, and it is phenomenal. I cannot get enough of this beer. It is a perfect balance of pineapple, um, but it, a hazy IPA. The hops are added a little bit later, something I've learned recently. And so... Uh, it's not so hoppy that it just overpowers the pineapple taste. So for me, this is a probably an 8.5 out of 10. And on untapped, I see that it is a 3.8. So that would translate to what, 7.6? So very close. Um, so overall, a great beer as well. We'll drink again. Nice. All right, guys, that is it for today's podcast. Oh, nice crunch. You finish it? I did. <laughs> so that is it for today's episode. As always, check our website out, buzzwordsmet.com. For this episode, we will put the PowerPoint slides up that we were referencing so that you can go look at the images yourself. We'll have plenty of practice exams up there as well, covering both this poem episode as well as pretty much every episode uh, we've uh, had so far. So check that out as well. Until next time, we will see you guys soon. Adios. Later. Oh, yeah. Like and subscribe. <laughs>
hit the bell notification so you can get reminded every time we upload. <laughs> Smash that like button. Gently tap that like button. Massage it. <laughs>